Hey, this is Leo for Actualized.org. And in this episode, I want to explore the question with you of whether you really want to be happy. Why aren't you happy in your life? It's an interesting question. Do you realize yet that you are not happy in your life? Have you acknowledged that to yourself? Some people even hide that fact from them. But hopefully you're aware enough to realize that you're not happy in your life. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here having this discussion. So the question is, why are you not happy? And uh, I want to submit a pretty crazy possibility to you, which is that you simply don't want to be happy. You actually do not want to be happy. And that sounds quite twisted. And it would sound like, well, Leo, uh, why would I do that to myself? Why would I purposefully torture myself like that? And, uh, and yeah, that's very interesting. Let's take a look at that. Why do you do that to yourself? Well, let me put it to you this way. If I ask you the question, do you really want to be unconditionally happy? Can you honestly say yes to that? Take this question seriously. Don't just kind of like say, oh yeah, of course, of course, Leo, it's obvious I do. Everyone does. Doesn't everyone? No, that's not obvious. Do you really want to be unconditionally happy? Let's explore what that really means if you say yes. Because most people, what they want and what they're pursuing in life is they're pursuing conditional happiness. So everyone, almost everyone says yes to conditional happiness, but I'm asking you unconditional happiness. Conditional happiness, let's contrast and compare these two. So conditional happiness, this means that everything goes your way and then you're happy. So that's easy. Everybody tries to do it that way. That's what you've been doing your whole life. The problem is it doesn't really work. Why doesn't it work? Well, think about it. It's actually very, very logical on practical everyday terms, right? Easy to understand why not. What do you need to be conditionally happy? It means you need oxygen, you need clean water, you need good food, you need sex, you need shelter, you need a husband or a wife, you need a good family, you need to have fun, you need entertainment, you need a cell phone, you need this, you need that. You need all these things. Hundreds, maybe even thousands of things need to be happening in your life every single second and every single minute and every single hour and every single day of your entire life. And as soon as it's not happening at any one point there, then what happens? You are no longer happy. Why not? Well, because you selected conditional happiness. That's what conditional happiness is. It's happiness when everything goes perfectly your way and it's unhappiness when something doesn't go your way. And of course, you know, to get a thousand things perfectly aligned every single second of every single day, well, what are the odds of that happening? Pretty low, right? Because the universe is a chaotic place and stuff happens that you don't want to happen. So that's conditional happiness. That's easy enough. What about unconditional happiness? Unconditional happiness, you might say, well, I want that too, Leo. Well, let's take a look at that. Do you really want unconditional happiness? Because to say yes to unconditional happiness would mean that you will be happy no matter what. Can you tolerate that? Think about that. It's not as easy as it seems. That means if you select to be unconditionally happy, what that means is you will be happy even if you don't get the food you like. You will be happy even if your country has laws that aren't favorable to you. You will be happy even if someone cuts you off in traffic. You will be happy even if someone slaps you in the face for absolutely no reason. You will be happy even if someone comes into your house at night and uh, steals all your money. 
You will be happy even if your business fails. You will be happy even if your child gets kidnapped and raped. You will still be happy. You will be happy if your family gets murdered. You will still be happy. Can you handle that? A lot of people can't handle that. Because it's really funny. What you've been doing your whole life is you've been setting up rules and conditions for happiness. You've been telling yourself such a like, well, I'll be happy when, you know, my family's doing great and I got enough money in my bank account and uh, I got a good job and uh, my kids are going to good school and all this kind of stuff, right? So when I propose to you that you can be happy independent of all those things, that presents a problem for you because your entire motivational system in life has been um, predicated upon achievement, achievement of certain things. And now I'm sort of robbing you of all your motivation. Because now, for example, if you can be happy without going to work, then you might ask, well, why should I go to work then? And if you can be happy without going to school, you should ask, well, why am I going to school then? And if you could be happy without great food, then you might want to wonder, well, why should I get good food then? And if you can be happy without being successful, you might wonder, well, why should I work so hard towards success? And those are all very good questions. Um, a lot of people would say, no, Leo, I want to be working on my business. I want my family to do nice, right? I want these things. I won't be happy until these things happen. I won't allow myself to be happy, Leo. I won't allow it because this is what I need to be happy. And here we really get to the crux of the problem. Is that you don't know what to do with yourself when you're actually happy. You've created these dogmatic rules for what you think you need to be happy, but you've forgotten that the thing you're actually pursuing is happiness and not the, the rules themselves, right? So if you believe you need to be successful to be happy, for example, or you need to have a lot of money to be happy, or you need to have a thriving family to be happy, um, actually you've got it backwards. What you need to do is you need to focus your mind on actual happiness and the means to the end that you're using should be disposable to you. You see? Because if you do it the other way around, then that means you can get caught in a loop of just doing activity for activity's sake, even when it no longer contributes to happiness. For example, you could get stuck pursuing success for 30 years of your life because you've disconnected success from happiness, you see? Really what you want is you want success, not happiness. And therefore what you'll get is you'll get success and not happiness. And then you'll say, well, that's fine. But see, it's not fine because what you fail to recognize is that what you actually want, what every human being really wants is happiness, fulfillment. You want fulfillment. That's what you really want. Not success, not a great family, not uh, great food or anything else. But you have to realize the ramifications of that. If what you want is truly happiness and fulfillment, that means that's like your ultimate goal. That means if you get that, that means nothing else matters to you. That's what that means. Now, most people can't handle this. Because to them, it's like, well, Leo, that means then, uh, you know, I have no more reason to go to work. I have no more reason to run a business. I have no more reason to, uh, to do all these things that I do. That's right. 
Because what this reveals now is it reveals that all your reasons and motivations for doing things are um, improperly grounded. And that's an important insight to have about all your motivations, isn't it? And you wonder why you have motivation issues. Could it be that the reason you have motivation issues is because your motivations are improperly grounded? See, as we grow up, we use motivation kind of like a carrot and stick model, where it's like when we do something wrong, we hit ourselves over the head with a stick, and when we do something right, we give ourselves a little carrot. And one of the ways you do this, one of the really deep ways you do this, is you create these kind of rules like, well, Leo, I will be happy when, when I have $100,000 of cash in my bank account. That's when I'll allow myself to be happy. Or you say to yourself, I'll be happy when I have a thriving business that transforms the world in some kind of important way. That's when I'll allow myself to feel happy. Or I'll feel happy at the end of the day only if I complete every item on my to-do list. Or I'll be happy only if I go to the gym and I'm able to bench press uh, 250 pounds this week. If I can do that, I'll be happy. And what I'm telling you is that for you to honestly answer yes to the question of, do you want to be happy? You have to answer yes. I want to be unconditionally happy. Which means that you have to accept that you will be happy even if you go to the gym and you can't lift those 250 pounds. That means you'll be happy even if you are lazy that week and you don't go to the gym at all. Imagine that. For some people, that's a horrific idea. Why? Because your motivation, your entire motivational system is basically a house of cards. That's how you set it up. It only works when you beat yourself and when you reward yourself. But that's a very poor kind of motivation. And I'm not just saying that you should stop guilting yourself and whipping yourself to get stuff done. I'm also saying you should stop rewarding yourself for getting stuff done. This is a much deeper point. So in prior episodes, maybe you've heard me talk about the difference between positive and negative motivation and how I say you can't get really far with negative motivation. I talk about this a lot in my life purpose course. You need to have positive motivation for doing stuff, which kind of makes sense to you. Pretty obvious idea, you know, if you're always whipping yourself to get stuff done, that gets tiring and it's pretty neurotic. So instead you want to like give yourself carrots instead of sticks. It feels nicer, but uh, we're going even deeper here. This is an even more advanced idea. What I'm telling you is that even positive motivation is really not good enough to be happy. Why not? Because by definition, in order to give yourself a carrot and for that carrot to have any meaning in your life, that means there need to be moments in your life where you don't have the carrot. You see? So there's a contrast. It's like you got to treat yourself, right? And you're only then happy when you've treated yourself for something. So what this does is this makes you a dog. You've turned yourself into a dog over the last 10 to 20 years of your life. That's what you've done, right? You've trained yourself very carefully. You've trained yourself without knowing that you've done this with little rewards. It's like, yeah, I went to the gym and then like you get a little reward. And that reward could be, you know, something like allowing yourself to eat some nice food or that reward could just be a little emotional reward. Like, like oh yeah, I've been a good little boy or girl today. Something like that. Usually the reward is very subtle. It's just like an emotional feeling inside you. But notice, the only reason this emotional feeling can work is because for the rest of the day, you know, for the first half of the day, before you did all this stuff, <laughs> you didn't have it. So um, that's the problem. That's the problem with unconditional happiness, is that when you are, I mean, with conditional happiness, right? That's the problem with conditional happiness is because when you set up conditional happiness, you guarantee 
that you will be miserable in your life. It's guaranteed. That is the structure you're using. That's how that structure works. So, um, so if you do that, then don't come complaining to me, Leo, I don't like my life. Leo, this part of my life sucks. Or I'm, I'm unsatisfied here. For some reason, you know, I'm depressed because I'm not fulfilled. That's the structure you're using. So that's exactly what you're getting. So don't be surprised. It's working perfectly. Your life is working perfectly, given the structure that you're using. So you need to change the structure if you want something better. And changing this structure can be a scary proposition because it calls into question your entire structure of motivations and how you view life in general, right? Most people, if you tell them, hey, I was happy while my child was being tortured and raped, they'll, they'll say, you're a monster. You're not allowed to be happy while your child is tortured and raped. As though my suffering is in any way really helping that situation. I mean, think about it from like a physical standpoint. <laughs> like, how is me sitting there and crying over what's happening to my child in any way helping the situation? It's a net negative. At least if I'm happy, well, at least I was happy during that thing. Now, you see, even the fact that the, I'm using this example, I'm using this example deliberately. You know, I chose this example because actually in you, it actually triggers a, like a, a little emotional response. You're like, Leo, what are you talking? This is, this sounds absurd. Like, how could you even say this? And I'm not saying that I necessarily would be happy if my child was getting tortured and raped. I'm just saying it, how weird that sounds to our ears, right? It sounds weird to our ears to say that. Um, but that's what I want to question. Because if you really think about it logically, like it makes no sense to use this kind of structure. Um, the reason it feels weird to you is because your entire motivational system is based upon the premise of carrots and sticks. And so you tell yourself, no, if I was happy while my child was getting uh, tortured and raped, that would be terrible because the way my motivation system is structured, that means that I would do nothing about it. See, I have to really, really worry and freak the fuck out to take action. That's what you're secretly admitting to there. You see? It's almost inconceivable to you that your child could be being tortured and raped, and you're happy as hell. But then you go out and take the right action anyways. That's hard for you to believe. Why is that? Because the way that you use emotions is you use emotions to bully yourself. See? And so now when we start fucking with your emotional um, triggers, which are so deeply connected to your motivations, when we start to like fuck around with the carrot and the stick, that's actually dangerous to you, right? What you're going to tell you, my, you're going to tell me as a as an objection, you're going to say, Leo, what you're advocating here is dangerous. Yeah, it's dangerous because of the fucking motivational uh, system that you have in your mind. So what needs to happen here as an ultimate solution is to change your entire foundation for how you're motivated. To really see that right now, you're not willing to accept unconditional happiness. Because what you've actually done is you've assimilated into your identity the actions that you take in order to maintain them. Because motivation, authentic motivation is difficult for you, what you've done is you've basically done this. You said, you know what? I'm a business person, so I'm the type of person who goes to work every morning on time. And you know what else? I'm a family person, so I treat my family well. I'm the type of person who treats my family well. And you know what else? You know, I'm a, I'm a healthy person. I'm the kind of person that goes to the gym consistently and works out. 
etc 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 right so you've 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 done this so that it's easier for you to motivate yourself because you can tell yourself oh yeah i am these things these are part of who i naturally am so then i'm drawn to do them now you might say well what's wrong with that well <laughs> that's uh it's very problematic you see because what happens when the thing you've assimilated into your identity turns out not to actually produce happiness for you. What happens then? Like, let's say you've assimilated into your identity an idea such as, I'm an ultra-efficient worker. I work really, really hard. That's who I am. See, you've done this now, and so now what you've done is you've placed this efficient, hard worker as a higher priority than happiness, you see? Because it's part of your identity. Because see now, if I tell you, hey, you're working so hard, you're working 90 hours a week, maybe you should stop that because it's not getting you happiness. You're suffering. And you'll say, no, I can't do that, Leo. Can't do it. Why not? Because that's who I am. But it's not getting you happiness. No, Leo, it doesn't matter. That's who I am. And there's a problem, right? Because once something becomes a part of who you are, it's so painful for you to give it up that you will actually sacrifice lots of happiness to maintain your identity. Even though it's making you miserable. Right? Uh, and don't think this is so far-fetched. Don't think that you don't do this in your life. What I'm talking about applies right to you. And not just to one facet of your life, but in many, many ways. Big ways and small ways. Right? Uh, and you're terrified by the idea of actually letting go of some of the things in your identity because then it's like, well, Leo, if I'm not a hard worker, it's like, I don't even know who I am. Exactly. Exactly. There's the rub. And it's like, Leo, if I'm not a hard worker, how am I going to go to work tomorrow? Why should I even go to work? That means I'm going to like stop going to work and I'm going to lose my house and my family. And my wife's going to leave me because, you know, she, she, she's going to divorce me if I don't have enough money to, you know, to provide for us and for our kids and all this stuff. You see where your mind goes with this? Um, yeah. And that that's a legitimate threat to you. That's a real threat. So you can't let it go. You have to stay being this hard worker. And it's all ultimately because you've lost touch of what's really important. Happiness. It's really that simple, just happiness. But see, you have all these rules about how to be happy. It sounds ridiculous to you when I say that the reason you're not happy right now or ever in your life is because you don't allow yourself to be. You will say, no, Leo, that's fucking ridiculous. That You're smoking some hippie, uh, uh, you know, weed telling me these things. That's not what's really keeping me unhappy. The reason I'm unhappy is because, here's a list, Leo. I made a list of 50 fucking items, one through 50. If I get each one of these, then I'll be happy. And what I'm telling you, that's a fucking lie. That's the that's one of the biggest fucking tricks that your mind plays on you is coming up with this list and then telling yourself, oh, all I got to do now is just check every item off this list. That's never going to work. It's never going to work. You don't understand yet how your mind works. That's not possible, you see. That's not possible. Because what you're really shooting for is not happiness. It's the shit that you're marking off the list. That's really what you're attached to. You're attached to your list, to your rules. And how is the list generated? Through your, the rules in your head. So you have rules like, well, I can only be happy if I earn X amount of money. I can only be happy if I'm X amount of body fat percentage. I can only be happy if I have a certain kind of uh, spouse or girlfriend or boyfriend. I can only be happy if I'm driving my kind of car that I like. I can only be happy if I'm eating 
uh, sushi three times a week. And I can only be happy when uh, uh, there aren't any noisy neighbors around me creating noise and distracting me. And I can only be happy when I go to work and I have a nice productive work day. And I can only be happy when my kids are, are being good kids and getting at least B pluses, you know, if they get a B, if they get a B minus, I'm not going to be happy. And so, you know, for every person, they have a different set of rules. This set of rules is, uh, is basically learned from your childhood and, uh, just kind of pick, you kind of just pick it up and develop it as you're growing up, you know, your family values play into it, your, your religious values, your community values, you know, the TV shows you watch and all this stuff, they basically create these kind of rules for you. Um, and so there you have it. And you wonder why you're not happy. You will never be happy under this paradigm. What's necessary is for you to realize like, ah, there's a deceptive little game here that my mind is playing on me. What if I let go of some of these rules? Could it really be so simple as just letting go of some of these rules? There's an ice cream truck driving by. It's kind of distracting me. Anyways, um, yeah, so can I really let go of some of these rules? And is it really easy? No, it's not easy. It's difficult. What I'm saying is actually extremely difficult for you because you have to really go deep inside your mind and question some of these very, you know, deep rules that are probably rooted in your childhood and in your whole system of morality and in your, uh, you know, your web of beliefs. It's probably even tied in with like your metaphysics and what you think is, uh, is true about reality. Like all that stuff informs then what you want from reality and what you think is necessary from reality to be happy, right? You might have a rule where it's like, I can only be happy if I'm going to church every Sunday. And I can only be happy if I'm doing spiritual things. And I can only be happy if I'm uh, contributing to mankind in some way. What you will eventually discover, if you're sticking with me on this self-actualization journey, is that uh, if you really want happiness, and if you're tired of suffering through your life, day after day after day for decades, then you have to bite the bullet and accept unconditional happiness at some point in your life. And you have to basically allow yourself to be, to be happy no matter what's going on, even if all sorts of shit is happening around you, even when things aren't going your way, even when your business is failing, even when you're lazy, even when you're procrastinating, you know, even when you're depressed, you can still be happy. That sounds weird and paradoxical, but hey, that's how the mind works. So how do you question these rules? Well, that's deep inner work, right? You got to go in there and you got to ask yourself, why do I feel like I need this to be happy? What's the logical connection there? And usually what it all boils down to is that somewhere deep in your psyche, you feel a deficiency of some kind. It's like a hole that needs to be filled. And so you honestly believe that if you fill that hole, that will complete you. But what you don't understand yet is that these holes in your psyche, they can't be filled with physical things or with any kind of achievements or successes in the external world. All that you can do is you can look inside really deeply and you can realize, oh, this hole is an illusion. In reality, there are no holes in me. Every single moment of my life, I'm complete. There's nothing more that's necessary. And everything else that I get, sure, it's nice, you know, I won't reject a nice sushi dinner, and I won't reject some, you know, nice relationship if it comes to me. And I won't reject, uh, you know, earning some money. But um, I don't need them to make me happy. Now, you might say, well, Leo, if that was true, 
then uh, why would I do these things at all? Why would I pursue them at all? Like, think about this. If you were equally happy whether you got the sushi dinner or not, would you take the sushi dinner? It's an interesting thought experiment. I encourage you to ponder that for yourself and to see how would you really react if you didn't need the sushi dinner, like, at all. Um, basically, what you would come to is you'd realize that life is just a collection of experiences, right? And one experience is not particularly better or worse than another, even though we obviously tell ourselves that some experiences are so much better than others. But as you mature and as you go with me here on the self-actualization journey, one of the biggest things you're going to learn is that really it doesn't matter what the experience is, whether I'm eating sushi or not, or whether I'm doing this or not, whether I'm having sex or not, it doesn't matter. I can learn to enjoy any experience. I can find the magic in the experience. The fact that there even is an experience at all, even if it's an experience of pain, of deep pain, even that experience is still a remarkable thing in and of itself. Um, the problem is that we've really gotten disconnected from the magic of experience itself over time. And so really now, like our lives as adults have turned into this obsession of uh, min-maxing pleasure. It's like, well, pleasure's great and pain is terrible, so I'm going to do everything to maximize pleasure and everything to minimize pain. And that um, starts to backfire because it doesn't work too well. What you want to do instead to develop yourself towards unconditional happiness, which is possible. It's not a pipe dream. It's possible. It just takes work. Uh, if you can, if you want to move closer to that, then what you need to do is you need to start to just see experiences for what they are and appreciate them for what they are. Like I was in the dentist's office uh, getting my teeth cleaned the other day, and I generally don't like going to the dentist. It's not a very pleasant experience. You know, normally we wouldn't call it a pleasant experience when someone is picking around in your teeth with a, uh, with a, some metal sharp stick. Uh, but like the more that I'm meditating, the more self-inquiry work that I do, um, the more I notice consciousness developing in me, the more I can just sit in the dentist's office and even the dentist kind of picking at my teeth. And even though the sensation of uh, of her like picking in my teeth isn't itself pleasant to me. Just the fact that that experience is even happening to me at all is already something I can be kind of grateful for and still appreciate on some level. Now, uh, I'm not perfect at this, right? So I'm not saying that put me in any situation and I'll be perfectly happy. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that that's kind of like an ideal that you're working towards in this work. And it's helpful to realize that, oh, that's kind of what we're working towards. Because then it tells you that some of the stuff you're doing, uh, you should drop. Right? Some of your rules and stuff. You're looking for happiness in the wrong spots. A really good litmus test that I like for measuring your self-actualization and your capacity to be happy is this one. And it is, if I lock you in a box, like solitary confinement style, with no light, um, no entertainment, no stimulation, no conversation, nothing. All it is is just like a, a black box. It's very small. It's like, let's say, six feet by six feet by six feet, just like a cube. And it's got some ventilation holes for air so you don't suffocate. And it's got a place for you to, to go to the bathroom. And uh, you're like given food once a day so you don't die of hunger. And that's your fate for the rest of your life. There is no escape from that. You're going to be living in this box forever. Can you still be happy? Most people would say, no, of course not. It's ridiculous to even assume that such a thing is possible. 
Because look, Leo, look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Look at all the stuff we need to be happy. We need food and air and we need, and then we need like self-esteem and we need shelter and we need freedom and we need friends and we need social contact and love. Leo, what about love? How can you say people can be happy without love? Love is like essential to, to the universe and to, that's just how human beings are because we're, we're wired as social creatures. You know, all the scientists say that we're social creatures. Uh, I got news for you. That's all bullshit. The reality is that you don't need any of that. Undeveloped people need that. Highly developed people don't need that. And I don't just mean in the sense that, oh, well, yeah, of course, Leo, yeah. Once I climb the, the pyramid and I'm at the very top and once I got everything, once I got the money and the sex and the food and all this, yeah, then I don't need it. No, I'm saying you don't need it right now. You don't actually need it. The problem is, is for you to realize that is a ginormous, ginormous obstacle. It's not enough for you to just hear me say it and then just to believe it because you still got all those needs inside of you. You need to actually, this is called spiritually purify yourself of those needs. That's mostly what spiritual work is about. So spiritual work, we could say, on the one hand, it's about becoming enlightened and realizing the truth of reality and what you are. So that's kind of like the flashy side of spiritual work. Then there's the very um, like laborious, unflashy side of spiritual work, which is purifying yourself of every single need that you have. Even stuff like the need for food, for, for water and for air. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying you're going to live very long if you don't get food and water and air. You're going to die. But the fact that you need those things and you feel like you need those things to be happy, that's the thing we're addressing here. So yes, you will die without oxygen, but believe it or not, you can actually develop yourself to the point as a self-actualized person that you, you honestly are not attached to needing oxygen. What would that mean? Well, that means you'd have to face the fear of death and you'd have to overcome your fear of death. Is that possible? Yeah, it's possible. You can overcome your fear of death. And if you overcome fear of death for real, not as some idea, you know, sometimes people write me comments and they say, Leo, I'm not afraid of death. Uh, that's the biggest load of horseshit I've ever heard. Um, you're totally afraid of death. Totally afraid of death. So yeah, if you overcome your fear of death, then not having oxygen won't be so scary for you. And it won't seem as so implausible as a thing to be detached from, right? Notice that when you're detached from something doesn't mean that you abstain from it for the rest of your life. It simply means you are not attached to it, which is a different thing. So anyways, as I was saying with this little um, image of you living in this box, you know, if you were really, really self-actualized, if you were really, really aware, you'd have no problem living in a box. Uh, without contact, from humans, without love, without business, without money, without any of this stuff. It would not be a problem to you. Why not? Because you don't realize yet how extraordinary it feels simply to be conscious. See, you're totally out of touch with how good you can feel just by realizing that you're conscious. An ordinary person, you put them in a box like that, and we call it torture. It's called solitary confinement. Uh, you know, some people say that we shouldn't even allow this kind of uh, treatment of our worst criminals, the rapists and the murderers. We shouldn't allow them to be put into boxes like this. Uh, but it's only torture because the average mind is so underdeveloped. So this is a great litmus test, you know. Uh, you can just ask yourself, any day of the week, just ask yourself, if I was put in a box, would I be happier than I was a week ago? And if you can say yes, that means you've grown. And after five years of doing this work that I'm showing you how to do, uh, it'll no longer seem so implausible to you. And after 10 years of doing this work, it'll be like, oh man, I might actually enjoy living in a box. You know, if I lived in a box and people just gave me food, that'd actually be pretty cool. That means I could just sit and meditate 24 fucking seven. That sounds awesome. That sounds awesome. I want that. That might actually be a really good way to live. 
See, but to a person who hasn't done any consciousness work, doesn't understand awareness, hasn't done meditation work, you know, hasn't had any samadhi experiences, hasn't done any self-inquiry, um, hasn't really investigated uh, enlightenment and non-duality and who and what they are, then to them, this seems like complete hogwash. It seems like I'm just, you know, I'm talking fantasies here, not human psychology. None of this is real human psychology. This is some kind of fantasy you have. No, this is real human psychology, except that it's a rather extraordinary form of it because it's quite rare and because you don't know very many people like this. But believe it or not, you can find people in society who can do this. It's pretty cool. And I mean, they're pretty rare, but they're not that rare. I've met dozens of them. You can too. They're pretty normal people. This is the power of doing real deep inner work. What do you think detachment is? Like detachment is not an idea. Detachment's a real thing. There are people alive right now who are so detached from needing anything that they don't even really care about getting air. Of course, they breathe and they live and, and they do normal things. They don't live in boxes. They're just detached. And now think of how great life feels to those people. Because they're not living in a box. They're living in a very rich world with color, right? With light, with cars and technology and people and love and animals and nature and all this amazing stuff. And they can really soak that shit in because they're detached from it all. Detachment doesn't make you depressed. Detachment doesn't make you nihilistic. And it doesn't make you demotivated. It's like, well, I don't need anything, so I'm not going to do anything. No, it frees you up to do whatever the fuck you want. It's total freedom. With total freedom, you can enjoy anything much more so than you can when you're attached to something. Because have you noticed this? That even when you're enjoying something that you really enjoy, but are attached to, you actually suffer. That's a pretty remarkable thing to grasp in your direct experience. So a really good example of this, you know, I experience this personally whenever I'm eating ice cream. And I try to stay away from dairy so I don't eat ice cream very much. But, you know, if I'm eating some kind of dessert that I really love, that I rarely eat, and I decide to just like splurge and treat myself so I'll get a... Uh, you know, a quart of ice cream or something, and I'll be sitting there on my couch eating it. And as I'm eating it, you know, I'm really enjoying it. It's so good. I wish I could just eat it forever. But right there, I'm suffering. Because already as I'm digging into that ice cream with my spoon, I can see the level of the ice cream gets lower and lower and lower. And I already know it's going to get to the bottom. And I already know the feeling I'm going to feel when my spoon hits the bottom you know, the empty bottom of the carton. And then it's like, shit, I'm out of ice cream. And I already know I'm going to be suffering in five minutes when I hit the bottom. I haven't hit the bottom yet. I still have a bunch of ice cream to go, but already I'm suffering. I'm suffering even before I'll really be suffering. And that pretty much summarizes what your life is like. So, yeah, there's a lot to be aware of here. Uh, I encourage you to really work towards just accepting this idea of unconditional happiness. Rethinking, like, how would you have to go deep down inside your mind, like, into the real core of your web of beliefs, and rethink some stuff there in order to just be able to say yes to unconditional happiness? Stuff will have to change for you, right? Your, your entire worldview will have to change. Everything in your life from the past will have to be refactored. You'll have to admit to yourself that for the last 10 or 20 years, I've been setting up all these rules to be happy, and they were all unnecessary. And I was just pretending. And that can be, that can be difficult to accept. It can be difficult to fully integrate that, right? You have to go back into your mind and, and refactor many experiences and, and many assumptions you have, very core assumptions about life. 
Because right now, you probably have assumptions such as, I need money to be happy, and I need uh, sex to be happy, and I need all these other things in specific proportions. But I want you to really look at that with awareness and to ask yourself, wait a minute, could these rules for happiness be backfiring on me? And maybe I've forgotten what the point of life is. That the point of life is not to do shit, it's not to be busy, it's not any specific activity, it's not any identity structure, the point is just pure happiness. And that might be quite scary for you to accept, because you're going to be lost for a while, for a few days, or for a week, or for a whole month. Maybe you're going to feel like, man, Leo, you've robbed me of all my motivation, I don't know what to do with my life anymore. Because if I can just be happy with nothing, then what the fuck am I doing? Stay with that. That's a super, super healthy, very deep and very valuable realization to have. Trust that your motivation will come back to you. Motivation is one of those things that it, it's scary to kind of let go of because you feel like, man, if I, if I just undermine my motivation, then everything is going to fall apart. But actually what you realize is that when you let go of your neurotic motivations, yeah, some things might fall apart, but those things that fall apart, those are the inauthentic things. That's fine. Let those things fall apart. Have the courage to go through that initial period of, of fear and, and kind of confusion and loss of direction. What will happen then is that your mind will kick back in. Your mind is a machine for generating motivation on all sorts of levels, from the most neurotic to, uh, to kind of everyday motivations to the most divine motivations. And if you want to move to the most divine and the most beautiful, most healthy forms of motivation, start to shed some of the neurotic stuff right now that's fueling you. All right, so good luck with that. Stay with it and keep the faith. I'm signing off. Go ahead, post me your comments down below. Please remember to click the like button for me. Share this episode with a friend. And lastly, come check out Actualize. I'll right here. This is my newsletter and website. There's some exclusive stuff you can find on the site. There's a forum you can check out. But the newsletter you want to stay on track with because if you sign up to that, every single week you'll just be getting updates from me with new content that I'm releasing that will help you to understand more and more about how your mind works. And your mind tends to work in very deceptive and counterintuitive ways that a lot of times you're not aware of and you won't be aware of for decades unless you hear somebody talking about it, someone who's done a lot of research on this stuff and continues to the way that I do. All right, so uh, stick with me. This is a self-actualization journey. It's a path. Watch every single new episode. Use them to build up a really high-quality mental model of how this whole process of human development works. And then you'll have a power. You'll have a power to change your life in whatever ways you want. Which is the power that you've really been seeking your whole life, but you didn't know where to find it. You thought you would find that power out there in accomplishments. But really, the power has been inside you the whole time. It's just all about self-knowledge. The more self-knowledge you develop, and the truer it is, the more the world becomes your oyster. So, sign up, stay on track, and I'll see you soon with more.